sorts of things with balloons. I don't know if you know this, um, but I am an amateur balloon artist, and you can do things with just one balloon, such as this simple balloon hat. See how awesome that it is? I mean, a one balloon animal or a one balloon hat could look something like this. It looks kind of cool, a one balloon hat, but there's only so much you can do with one balloon. But if you have two balloons, you can do even more, right? You can make it look even better. I mean, look at the intricacies on this hat. You see the bubbles up top, the triangles. This is a beautiful crown that a lot of princesses love to wear. You know, you can do amazing things with, a, with two balloons. But beyond that, if you go beyond that to five balloons, you can have an even greater piece of art with this five balloon crown that was put together. All kinds of different things that you can do with these balloons. In the hands of a person who knows what they're doing, balloon artists create balloon dresses, balloon wearable costumes, life-size grand pianos, motorcycles, and different works of art. I have friends that are able to put those things together, but it has to be in the hands of someone who knows what they're doing. When you put your hand, when you put your life in the hands of God, you're in good hands, even better hands than Allstate. If you put your life in his hands by confessing Jesus as your Lord, you will find that God is so good at taking you where you need to go and showing you what you need to be. That's what happens when we confess Jesus as our Lord. Confessing Jesus as our Lord is recognizing him as the one who is in control. You know, you can't make Jesus Lord because to make Jesus Lord would be to say that he's not Lord already. What we do is we agree that Jesus is Lord and we conform our lives to agree with Jesus being Lord. And Jesus being Lord is the foundation of community in the church. You know, most of the communities that we're a part of, the word community common unity. There's a commonality that results in unity. Most communities that we're a part of, I would say are godless communities. I would say that there are godless communities for a community to be based on the lordship of Jesus. What should you talk about in that community? God, right? You should talk about God. You should talk about Jesus. And we have all sorts of communities that we're a part of. I'm a part of some of those. We're a part of communities that involve our kids' sports and athletics. We have friends and families that we're around that we talk to on a regular basis. We have our school community. Maybe your kids go to school and you know different families and different parents and different kids that go there. You know the teachers and the principal and the assistant principal and those. those that's another community that we're connected with. You have your work community. People that you work with, talk to on a regular basis, and you talk about work things and what you're going to do on the job, you have that kind of community. You have your hobby community. Maybe you have a hobby that you enjoy, whether it's music or sports or something that you collect. You have that community. And if you look at each of those communities, ask yourself, how much does God come up in that community? We would probably say most of the time, if God does come up, it's like a passing metaphorical nod to the man upstairs that he exists, right? But a community that recognizes Jesus as Lord does not just give God a nod, but makes God the focus and the center of what we do. That's why the church community that gathers and focuses on Jesus being Lord is a foundational and important part of the development and life of someone who trusts and follows Jesus. That community is vitally important. And whenever you trust Jesus as Lord, you pursue that community by having a common person in Jesus, by having a common position of humility towards one another, because that's what that takes in a relationship, to have humility, to care about other people more than you care about yourself, and also a common pursuit of the gospel. That is that Jesus saves people from their sin. And that's what we're going to talk about today as we look at the next part of the confession of we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, our Lord. Our big idea today is that we believe in Jesus Christ, 
God's only son, our Lord. And looking at Philippians chapter 2, understanding that in Philippians chapter 2, Paul, the author, is writing to the church that is located in Philippi. And Paul's current situation is not looking so good. He's in chains in a Roman prison. He believes that he could be potentially released and see the Philippian church again, but he's not sure. I mean, he could, it could end in his death, but he, he believes that he may be released. And he's writing to the Philippian church, the people that are gathering in the name of Jesus there in the town of Philippi. And those people are facing similar opposition. Paul says that they're facing opposition in a similar form that he is, potential arrest and putting in, put in jail. They could face torture or suffering. They could also face death for following Jesus and trying to help other people do the same. And Paul is trying to help them to understand how do you walk through this difficulty that you're facing. And at the end of Philippians chapter 1, he is telling them that the way they do that is having community, being one, being together, focused on one purpose, and that is contending for the faith of the gospel. Contending for the faith of the gospel means is to continue to believe in Jesus, pursue Jesus, and to help other people do the same. And then we get to Philippians chapter 2, where we see that when you confess Jesus as your Lord, you agree with him that he is Lord, that you have a common person in Jesus. When you confess Jesus as your Lord, your community has a common person in Jesus. In Philippians 2.1, it says, If then there is any encouragement in Christ. If then means because you need to have community that helps you to continue on in spite of the opposition. He said then he's listing off a few different things that are true. He's saying if these things are true, then this is what you need to do. If there is any encouragement in Christ. If you're going to find encouragement, you're going to find it in Jesus. If any consolation of love, to be consoled is to be comforted when you're going through a difficult time. If there's any fellowship with the Spirit, what binds us together and what binds us together with Christ is the Holy Spirit that He gives us when we give our life to Jesus. If any affection and mercy, affection is the way that we love one another. Paul, at the beginning of this letter, tells the Philippian church, I have the affection for you that is the affection of Jesus Christ. The affection is how we love one another. And then he says, and mercy. Mercy is not being harsh. It doesn't mean to be kind to the point that you lie to people to be nice to them. What mercy means is that even though they may deserve this, your kindness is I want them to be better. I'm honest and truthful about where you are. I'm honest, but at the same time, I'm not harsh with you. And then he says, make my joy complete. Paul is saying that if these things are true, you can make my joy complete. Part of Paul's joy is dependent on the Philippian church and how they respond to this opposition. They could quit. They could say, I'm not going to continue on. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to live as Jesus is my Lord. But Paul says, if you do that, my joy is not going to be complete. If you want complete joy, true joy, as God wanted us to discover it and have it and experience it, then we need to realize our joy is dependent on relationships with one another. That we can give each other joy as we build community and have more unity with one another, or it could affect our joy. We don't have as much joy. It says in verse 2, make my joy complete by thinking the same way. How do you make Paul's joy complete? By thinking the same way. The same way as who? I think it means two things. One, thinking the same way as Jesus thought. Whenever you think like Jesus thinks, that makes other believers' joy complete. Not only that, whenever we as a group decide we're going to think the way, same way that Jesus thinks, that makes each other's joy complete. Because you cannot be who you need to be for one another if you're not thinking the same way as Jesus does. So he says, make my joy complete by thinking the same way. How does Jesus think? Having the same love. Jesus' thinking was characterized by love, loving his father with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving his neighbor as himself. United in spirit, 
This word for spirit is referring to his desires. He says we need to have the same desires as Jesus. Whenever we are thinking like Jesus, that's characterized by love for God and love for other people, then we have similar desires that Jesus had. And then it says intent on one purpose. The one purpose that Jesus was focused on was what he was focused on from the very beginning. When the angel told Mary, you shall have a son, you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save people from their sin. That's what Jesus came for. Jesus came to save people from their sin. Our life purpose is to be right with God through Jesus and to help other people do the same. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. We exist because there is a mission that's supposed to be accomplished. And that's what Paul's pointing to, to say, this is what unifies you. This is the commonality that results in unity. And the common person you're going to find that in is Jesus. And so he says, having the same love, uniting the same spirit, intent on one purpose. And then he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. Do nothing that completely and totally and only benefits you. If your life is lived just to benefit yourself, then that is not how Jesus thinks. Jesus didn't just use his power just to benefit himself. He could have done that, but that's not what he did. And he says, do not do this out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, consider others more important than yourselves. Put other people first. Verse four, everyone should look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Notice he doesn't tell you to completely neglect yourself. But what he does say is the reason that you take care of yourself is so that you can take care of others. That's why you do that. You care for you so that you can serve and love and care for one another. This is what builds community. This is what brings people together. A common person in Jesus. Just the other day, I was cutting invitations for youth ministry over in the workroom. And we have this paper cutter that we use. It's it's new and there's a little bar right there where you cut paper that's supposed to prevent your hand from sliding over into the blade. I don't know if you've used one of those before, but I was using it. And whenever I get going, I get a system going. I get moving, you know. I'm like, chop, chop, chop. I was really chopping the invitations. I was going. And somehow, whenever I slid my hand over, my thumb was raised up. Instead of hitting the bar, that's supposed to prevent that from happening, it slid right over the top of the bar, and I bring the blade down onto my finger. Praise God for fingernails, because it was my fingernail alone that kept any more damage from happening, and it hit my finger. And that pain in my finger sent a message to my brain saying, you are in pain. And I was jumping all over the workroom going nuts because of how bad it hurts. That pain in my finger affected everything else in my body. We affect each other. And our decision to confess Jesus as Lord and to follow him and live like Jesus as Lord affects one another. If the majority of the community that we have and our closest relationships that we have are God-less community, then we are learning to live a God-less life. That is not the kind of life that God wants for you. He wants you to have a God-filled life. Jesus-centered life. That's what you were created for. That's what you were designed for. You see, God has a design that he wants us to follow. And that is a life that is lived for his glory through Jesus. That's what he's made us for. And if the majority and our closest relationships are to with those who are, or do not live for God, then that's what we're learning. That's how we're learning to live. We're learning to live life without God. And when we come on Sunday, it seems like this is a foreign place. The word that is preached from the scripture seems like a foreign language, like a foreign culture that doesn't fit in with anything else. But God is the one that's given us this life, and God wants to be a part of every part of our life. If you've ever invited someone into your home, you might have told them, make yourself at home. But that's not what you mean, right? When you invite someone in your home, you say, make yourself at home, you don't want them to go into your closet and start trying on your clothes, (laughs) right? That wouldn't be, you wouldn't want that. And you don't want them to just go in your fridge and start eating everything in your fridge and leaving it all over the house, 
You don't want them to do that. You don't want them to go and leave their shoes on and jump up in your bed with their muddy shoes all over your comforter. You don't want that to happen. When you bring something, someone to your home and say, make yourself at home, what you literally mean is make yourself at room, the room I put you in. And I want you to use it in this way, you know, and you give little bits of instruction as they're in the room about different things that, you know, we do in this room. Whenever you confess Jesus as Lord, you're not telling him to make himself at room in your life. You are telling him to make himself at home in your life. And he can get into every part of your life that he wants to get into because he is Lord When you confess Jesus as Lord, you have a common person that you're pursuing. We should all be pursuing Jesus. But we also have a common position, and that is a position of humility. We have a common position of humility. And we see that in the life of Jesus, looking in verse 5 of chapter 2. He says, adopt the same attitude. Adopt the same attitude is remembering that he's already told you to think like Jesus. And that we need to think like Jesus together. And then he says, adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. What kind of attitude did he have? Who existing in the form of God. The form means the same as. Jesus is the same as God because he is 100% without any doubt God. People recognize that. They recognize that when he was 12 years old in the temple and he was sharing with people who have been studying the Bible their whole life and they were blown away by his wisdom. It was obvious this isn't any normal kind of kid. Not only that, the miracles that he'd done. He was able to control weather. He, he's calmed the storm. He was able to take little, very little food and multiply it miraculously so over 5,000 people could eat. Jesus was able to walk on water. Jesus was able to tell demons to get out of people, and they were out. Jesus said whenever he was being arrested in the garden that he had the power to call 72,000 angels to come fight for him. He had an army of angels that listens to his beck and call. Jesus is able to heal the blind, heal the mute, heal the deaf. He was able to make lame people walk. He was able to raise people from the dead. Jesus is God. And everybody that that interact with him recognized that when he did a miracle. He was God and he was continually trying to get his disciples to understand that he was greater than what they expected. Right? They were always worried about Jesus. Jesus, you're going to get yourself killed if you go over there. Jesus said, nothing happens to me that I don't want to happen to me. You know, I'm completely in control. Everything that happens to me is my choice. I choose to do that. So being in the form of God, being equal with God, he did not consider equality with God. He was equal with God as something to be exploited, which meant he could have been the kind of God that said, you know what? I'm God and all you people messed up. You sinned, you deserve to be punished for all of eternity, and I'm going to stay comfortable up here in heaven, and I'm not going to trouble myself with trying to save you or fix what you've broken. God could have done that, but Jesus said, but Jesus did not use his power only for himself. What did he do? He instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. How did he assume the form of a servant? Taking on the likeness of humanity. Jesus had not always been man. He had always been God, but he had not always been man. And we call this the incarnation. He took on humanity. He became a man. Notice that it says that the form of a servant was humanity. We are God's servants, whether we recognize him as Lord or not. And in fact, Paul opens this letter by saying about him and Timothy, who's sending this letter, we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul recognizes that and writes that here, that Jesus took on the form of a servant. And when he had come as a man, the Greek literally says being found as a man. Not only was Jesus completely God, and he demonstrated that, but when people interacted with Jesus, they discovered he was completely a man. Jesus was tempted. There was a time whenever he was led away into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. He was tempted by the devil. He was tempted like a man. Jesus got hungry like a man. He needed sleep like a man. He would go away and he would rest in isolation from other people because they were wearing him out. I mean, if you were talking to 5,000 people all the time, you would probably get worn out too, right? And he would go take breaks and he would rest. He got thirsty. He was at the well meeting the Samaritan woman. It says that he was thirsty. He got hungry. Jesus ate things. Jesus felt pain. Jesus cried, it said, whenever he was interacting with Mary and Martha, who was upset because their brother Lazarus had died. The shortest verse in the Bible says, Jesus wept. Jesus was completely and entirely man. 
And not only that, Jesus suffered and Jesus died. Jesus is 100% God. He is 100% man. And so he's being found as a man. Look, look what he does. Even though he's the most powerful being in all of the universe, it says he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, to the point being become obedient to the point of death. And then it says even to death on a cross. Jesus didn't simply die of a heart attack. He didn't simply die because things were breaking down from old age. Jesus died a horrible and horrific death as a criminal. And he could have chose otherwise. When, when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden, his disciple, Peter, who often acted first and thought about it later, pulled out, pulls out a sword and chops off the ear of the servant of the high priest who was there to assist in arresting Jesus. And Jesus said, put your sword away. People who use the sword die by the sword. He said, if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels. 12 legions of angels is 72,000 angels. Jesus said, I got 72,000 angels that are just waiting for me to tell them what to do. And I could call them right now. I could end all of this. He said, but I'm not. That's what kind of power Jesus had. And Jesus could have chose otherwise, but he didn't. He chose to die. Why? To primarily benefit you. To save you. To make a way for you to be right with God. So we have a common position in humility. You see these balloons up here. If these balloons are going to become what they are, they have to have the kind of humility that allows twisting and turning and bending for them to become the way that they are. If they do not twist and turn, then they cannot be the kind of balloons that they are. They cannot become the things that they're becoming. You see, they have to be willing and have the humility to twist and to turn to become the things that they are. And whenever they have that kind of humility, they can become all sorts of things, including closer to one another. You see, if you have humility and say, you know what, I'm going to use what God has given me to care more for others and to care more for God than I care for myself, then we create community that is so strong that no matter what kind of opposition that you face or what kind of difficulty you face in life, we continue to go on together helping one another, encouraging one another. You need the kind of community that's focused on a common person, Jesus, and that has a common position, humility, saying, I care about these people in here even more than I care about myself. The reason I take care of myself is so that I can care about the people who are in here. I care about them. I love them. They matter to me, and I want to be Jesus to them, and it binds us together. So we have, when we confess Jesus as Lord, we have a common person that we're pursuing, Jesus we have a common position, which is humility, but we also have a common pursuit, and that is the gospel. We have a common pursuit of the gospel. That is what we're focused on. For this reason, since Jesus has demonstrated that he is equal with God, since Jesus has demonstrated that he cares about others, even though he has all the power in the universe, he is omnipotent, all-powerful. He's omniscient, all-knowing. He's omnibenevolent, all-good. He is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at one time. He fills all of space and all of earth. He is everywhere. Even though he has that kind of power, he chooses to put others first. For this reason, verse 9 says, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name. Highly exalted is a superlative, superlative which means he is the greatest there ever was and ever will be because he is God. If Jesus was in high school and they were handing out senior superlatives about the most likely to be popular, the most likely to succeed, the most likely, Jesus would wipe the board in every category and they would have to come up with a new category for him, the most likely to be God, and they would give it to him because that's who he was. And because of that, God has highly exalted him. Whenever you exalt Jesus in your relationships, you're doing exactly what God wants you to do. When you exalt Jesus in your life, you're doing exactly what God would do, exalting Jesus. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, 
So at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice how it says every, 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 because everything is supposed to be pointed towards and focused on Jesus. Notice in verse 11 where it says every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why does God want Jesus to be elevated in your life? Because when he's elevated in your life and in your relationships, you have confessed him and agreed with him that he is Lord. Whenever other people confess him as Lord, they're in agreement with God that Jesus is the boss, the king of their life. That should be our goal. That is the gospel. The gospel is Jesus came to earth, died on a cross, and rose again so that people would confess and agree that he is Lord and would live that way because that is how you have been designed. That is the foundation of the community that we are trying to build here is a group of people who is so much like Jesus, imitating so much and focused on a similar pursuit of helping other people take their next step with Jesus. For some, that's faith in Jesus. For others, it's getting into a closer community that's focused on Jesus. That's what we're trying to do because that is how we are designed. And whenever we confess Jesus as Lord and we build community on that, it says to the glory of God the Father, God is glorified. You were made to worship God by elevating Jesus in your life and in the lives of other people. In the 1950s, a, a man named Solomon Ash did an experiment with a, a group of people. And he had one person who was the subject of the experiment. And he also had different actors who had scripted answers that they would give whenever they would, were a part of this experiment. What he did was, is he brought one person who was the subject and believed that everybody in the room was a subject being tested. Little did they know that everyone else was an actor who was given scripted answers of what to say. And they would be brought in and given a test. And the test they would be given is very similar to this. They would say, there's a line on this side. Pick out a line on the other side that is the same length as the line on this side. What they found was, is whenever the subject came in with the actors with scripted answers, as long as some of the actors said the correct answer, which is B, is the same length as this line, then the person who was the subject would agree and say, yes, B is the same length as this line over here. But if the actors, if the majority of them said the wrong answer on purpose, then the, at, then the person who was the subject would pick the wrong answer on purpose as well. Especially when it came to be three or more actors that would pick the wrong, wrong answer. And in fact, they would come in and say, yeah, C is definitely the same length as the line over here. And the subject would be like, what, what are they talking about? You know, they would look at it. You could tell they knew that they picked the wrong answer. And then after four, five, and six of the actors would pick the wrong answer on purpose, even though... The subject knew that B was the right answer. They would purposely pick C, knowing it was the wrong answer, just to go along with everyone else. What they discovered in this experiment is that we would rather be wrong with the crowd than right by ourselves. That is how important community is. That is why we do not need godless community. We need God-filled community. We need community that is focused on a common person, Jesus. A community where we, ha we choose a common position, humility, where we care about others more than we care about ourselves. And we need a community with a common pursuit, and that is the gospel, helping people take their next step with Jesus. That's what we need. Some of you sitting here today, you, you might come on Sunday morning a good bit, and maybe you're not connected with a small group. That is where real community happens. That is where relationships are built. That is where you really bind together and care for one another. It is vital to your relationship with Jesus. Absolutely important. Those 12 disciples that followed Jesus, they didn't get that close to one another because they met in the crowd of the 5,000. What would Jesus do? Jesus spent a lot of time with those guys on their own, right? Without the 5,000 people they were feeding and ministering to. Small group is that important. Today, there's two possible responses to this message. One, there is the possible response that you need to confess Jesus as your Lord. 
Confessing Jesus as your Lord doesn't mean that you're asking Jesus simply to save you from hell. Some people do that. They say, Jesus, I want you to save me from hell. And they don't ask Jesus to save them from their sin. Basically, what they're saying is, it's kind of like a child. They only feel bad about what they've done when they're experiencing the consequences of what they've done. They're like, they don't feel sorry for what they did. They feel sorry that they got caught. Um, So whenever we confess Jesus as Lord, what we're saying to Jesus is, Jesus, you are the Lord, not just over my future eternity, where I'm going to spend eternity, but I want you to be the Lord of my life right now. I want to give my life to you. Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus Put faith in him and ask Jesus to save you from sin. That's one possible response. A second possible response to this message is saying, you know what? I'm not in the kind of community that you've been talking about today that's based on the lordship of Jesus. What you need to do is to take your communication card or open up your church app and say that you want to join a small group. I want to find out more about a small group. And you need to check that off and say, I want to find out about new small groups that are starting. I want to find out about small groups that have been meeting. I need to have that kind of community. Because you are made not for a God-less community. You are made for a God-filled community that's based on the Lordship of Jesus. If today you need to confess Jesus as Lord, all you have to do is say a simple prayer doing that. If everyone could close their eyes and bow their heads, and you're saying today, with no one looking around, closing your eyes, If you say today, I need to confess Jesus as my Lord. I want to give him my life. I want to be forgiven for sin. You just simply say a prayer like this. Jesus, I am a sinner. And I know that my sin has broken many things. Including my relationship with you. Jesus, I know that you died on the cross and rose from the grave to save me from my sin. Right now, I am confessing you as my Lord, agreeing to give my life to you. Jesus, save me from my sin. I'm following you from here on out. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me.